Yes, my 10 seconds of glory. <laughs> have you had anybody request a, the headphones yet? No, no, no. Not the mics I've been here. Yeah. I think you're not on the mics. <laughs> I know, I feel so sorry for you guys. No, just get your sandwich and go. Do you know who they are? I saw that. There has been one night so far that I was like, oh, that looks really good. Okay. No, no, I tried them once, and I took it home, mm -hmm. and then I ate it, up and I was like, oh, this is just <laughs> Like, it's just payback for all the presentations that we just sit there with our hands down, and y'all are interpreting. Yeah. We're getting back to it. I know. I turn into like this guy. Yeah, right. Right. We got here. Who's that John. John does it. John does it. Yeah. I think. I think. Yeah. You get it? Okay. Thanks for Appreciate it. Hi, y'all. How's it going? Good. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. So have y'all been sticking around for the whole meeting, or do you sneak out? Well, yesterday, when I heard they were voted to extend the community, and there I went to one of the values Yeah. Yeah. Y'all are... I mean, the other girls... I did that on my own without asking her because she's a lot of moments. Yeah. So I just went and told him and I was like, yeah, yeah. 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 they're already being paid yeah. for, you know, I've been here doing nothing. And they're extending it. Yeah. So I told him, you want to stay? And he said, no, no, you can go. There's no one here. And she was like, oh, I could have seen it. <laughs> for what? And I'm like, really? Just to get a little 30 more minutes? Yeah. Right. Yeah, especially you know, they go to eight, eight thirty, a little past that. That's just like yeah, no, I, I was I was working on a computer and some documents, so I use this time to do there you something. There go. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm I don't blame you at all. Yeah, it would be really. It's Chris today, but she. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. 
ask everyone to start taking their seats. Welcome to the uh, Facility Improvements Committee of the proposed 2022 to 27 bond program for the city of San Antonio. I'd like to thank my co-chair partner in crime, Mr. Dwayne Robinson. We're gonna do our best of uh, working together to lead this group to a successful evening. This, uh, what's becoming a cold Thursday night. I'd like to thank everybody for uh, coming out, especially the citizens to be heard. We appreciate the community showing up and uh, being concerned about the vested interests of what we have for the city of San Antonio. A lot of great things are going on. We're going to make an announcement really quick. Buenas noches para las personas que hablan español. Hay servicios de interpretación al español disponibles. Aquellas personas que deseen escuchar la reunión en español pueden pasar a la mesa al fondo a la izquierda y le vamos a distribuir los dispositivos. Gracias. Today is going to be a, a, a good day of listening. A lot of listening is going to go on today. We're going to um, got a couple of key components going on. We're going to hear from Razi, our director of public works, to talk about the, uh, some questions and comments that came through with a couple other items. We're going to hear from the outside staff agencies that were recommended um, by the city council, by the, by the city manager staff. Uh, they're going to present. There's two, there's two of those groups presenting on their projects. And then we're going to go into public comment. Uh, after we go through those two listening sessions, then it will be committee discussion. And during that committee discussion, uh, Dwayne and I have been talking and we think it'd be best if we allow the council districts just a few minutes to collect your thoughts. Uh, because what we plan on doing is doing a little round one. Each district will ask their handful of questions, whatever projects they'd like to bring up or what protocol, policies, procedures, or if you wanna dive into specific, maybe a citizen to be heard public comment uh, issue that comes up. So we look forward to getting through this in a, in a good, in a timely manner. And we ask that everybody, again, let's respect each other's opinions. While we may not all see uh, eye to eye, the goal is for all of us to come together as a group in consensus to support a package that we can bring to the voters in the city of San Antonio in May. Dwayne, I'd like to turn over to you. All right, thank you, Chris. I also wanna acknowledge Chris and all of the hard work that he's been putting in so far. Um, just like everyone else in the building, I think all of these projects are extremely important for our community. I don't know why my mind keeps on going back to the proposed bond is gonna total $1.2 billion. That's a lot of money but yet the need, I mean, I don't think anyone in here probably could guesstimate what the need is, but it certainly far exceeds $1.2 billion. So we have to bear in mind that we just can't do everything that we would like to do. As, as co-chair, I am a District 2 resident, and I certainly would like to see uh, tremendous things changing in District 2. But as co-chair, I have to look at this more globally and try to look at it from the perspective of what's good for the overall city of San Antonio. So as we hear our citizens and we hear about all of these terrific projects, just take a step back and probably humbly realize that we just can't do all that we would like to do. Uh, one good thing that staff has made us aware of that generally we, we would have about 30 minutes allocated for citizens to be heard, but given the numbers that we have, we're gonna extend that to 60 minutes for the citizens to be heard, up to 60 minutes. So we do have some additional time and we kind of wanna pay that forward to the individual districts, as Chris stated a little bit earlier, it would be easier and probably more 
effective and efficient if you all just kind of huddle together and try to consider your questions collectively versus individually. But with that being said, unless there's anything else that I'm missing, Chris, we're gonna go ahead and go to the city's presentation. Good evening, bond committee members. My name is Maria Villagomez. I'm the deputy city manager for the city of San Antonio. Uh, thank you for serving for the committee. Just wanted to introduce myself. I'll be uh, staffing this committee with the rest of our, our team. Thank you. Good evening, Chair and member of the committee. I am Razi Hosseini, Director, City Engineer for Public Works Department. Municipal and Public Health and Safety Facility as part of proposed 2022 bond program. We are asking 134 million for 17 projects to be funded. 60.8 million of this will be district project. What that means, this project is going to be in neighborhood. 58.6 million will be citywide. This the project is really serves entire community of city of San Antonio. 12.8 million will be project within the regional center. As part of SA tomorrow, we have identified 13 region. Downtown is one of them. Port SA is another one, Brooks Medical Center. And this 12.8 million will be on one of those facility. And we have 2 million for public art. Last bond, we had 1%. This bond we are proposing to have one and a half percent, which not going to include housing. Every other proposition is going to have one and a half percent for public art, with the exception of the housing. Municipal, municipal facility we are proposing, 10 of them. Carver Library is one of them, which city owned property. It will be renovation. The type of the project is going to be renovation and $12.5 million. Second one is Ella Austin, located in Council District 2. Also, there is going to be renovation, not brand new building, city-owned facility, and it will be $11.5 million. Las Palmas Branch Library is located in Council District 5, another city-owned facility maintained by library, and $5.25 million. Central Library, many of you know in downtown, is a citywide project for renovation and is maintained by library again. We have six million for that. Citywide municipal facility and resilience improvement. We are looking to on three city facility, Spanish Governor Palace, SA Municipal Record, and International Center, six million. We are looking to spend on that one to improve resiliency. Number, project number six, we have a, is a K9 facility, is going to be brand new request, and it will be $2.25 million. World Heritage Center phase two, phase one is under construction funded by 2017 bond program, and this will be 3.5 million for phase two. Magic Theater is another project we are proposing. This will be for renovation, city-owned facility, and it will be 2.75 million. Tower of America, many of you know, built in late 60s. We are going to do some structural renovation, city-owned facility, and managed by Landry, $10 million. And the last one is a public art. Again, 1.5 will be slightly under $1 million project. Public safety and uh, public safety and health facility, fire station number 10. We have many fire stations throughout the city. This fire station more than 100 years old. We need to replace this one and we are proposing $12.5 million for this replacement. New police substation in Council District 3. We have been working with Council District 3 office for the last few years. We have looked number of the site. We are proposing 19 million 
for construction of the brand new police substation in Southside, which is in Council District 3. Animal Care Hospital, we have proposing brand new facility for slightly over 50 million. Citywide public health facility and resilience improvement is, this is for public health, East Side Branch, Northeast Branch, and Bonavista Clinics, $3.69 million for renovation and resiliency. Citywide public safety facility resi resiliency, which is really include the fire department and police department facility, slightly over 11 million. Texas Biomedical Research Institute, which is not really a city-owned facility for renovation, and you will hear from, from them very detailed what they are planning to do and what's the benefit of their project for uh, our community, 11 million. And last one is public health, which is 1.5%, is slightly over 1 million. We want to make sure our bond very transparency. We have all of the information on COSA website. Community roster is there, meetings calendar is there, meeting document is there, and also we have report and all of the presentation as we finalize those, we put them online to community to see. Response memo and attachment. As we prepare response, any question you or other committee has, we load them on our system. People has easy access to refer to them. So far, we have answered from last meeting all of the questions, with the exception of one question regarding the city facility, and we will finalizing that one by tomorrow. This is an end of my presentation. After two other presentation is done, we will be available to answer any question you may have. Thank you, Raji. At this time, there are, as you saw before you and as you've read, there are two outside agencies that have received staff recommendation, and we'd like to ask those groups to come forward. We're going to begin with the Texas Biomedical Research Institute, and they will be given five minutes. Good evening. I'm Jamo Rubin. I am a doctor here in San Antonio. I was born in San Antonio. And for the last six years, I've had the honor of being the chair of the Texas Biomedical Research Institute. Texas Biomedical Research Institute is the country's only not-for-profit, independent, scientific research facility focused only on infectious disease. In February of 2019, if you think back for a second, I'll bet you know where you were. There was a lockdown in a city in China, and there were rumblings around the world that within a month created a global lockdown and no one left. People didn't know how to get to work. People didn't know how to do anything. By April, Texas Biomed sprung into action and devoted 50 of our scientists exclusively to research the COVID virus, and we were sought out by two international pharmacy companies, Pfizer and Regeneron, because we were the only place in the world where we could help them get their solutions into the hands of doctors. Later that year, the FDA approved these vaccinations and these infusions. If you got the Pfizer vaccine at the Alamo Dome, at Wonderland Mall, or at a clinic, if you got sick and got the Regeneron infusion, that's because of Texas Biomed, right here in San Antonio. We have become a crucial part of the public safety fabric of this community, not only because of our ability to solve these problems and deliver solutions into the hands of our local doctors, but also during this period, local employers sought us out to help them understand how to protect their employees and get them back to work safely. Texas Biomed has key community leaders on our board, such as Henry Cisneros and Joe Strauss, who alongside with our leadership team 
are helping make real strategic plan changes to double the size of our organization by 2028, and with that bring $3 billion a year of additional revenue to the San Antonio economy. Matt, would you like to talk more about the request? Thank you, Dr. Rubin. Good evening, everyone. My name is Matt Majors. I'm the Vice President of Operations at Texas Biomed. If you don't know Texas Biomed, we've been around in San Antonio for 80 years. And uh, we are very excited about the future. Texas Biomed, as, as Dr. Rubin noted, has a 10-year, $270 million plan to double in size. $30 million of that $270 million is earmarked for infrastructure priorities. Today, we come before you seeking $11 million in this bond, and that $11 million is part of the 30. Notable, the $270 million we intend to raise over the next 10 years, we expect to come mostly through philanthropic efforts and other partnerships. Now, we're going to go back again to a different February. This is February of this year, where many of us will probably also remember where we were when it got really cold, much colder than tonight. Uh, we, as Texas Biome, had been around 80 years, but like many of you as well, experienced a historic event. What we identified after the, after the storm was that this $30 million of infrastructure improvements in our 10-year plan needed to be accelerated. We have many old facilities and, in fact, experienced over 400 plumbing leaks. Uh, we experienced catastrophic water, sewer, and power failures. Uh, in fact, power is the lifeblood that keeps our facilities, including our high containment laboratories and our, our 2,500 non-human primates, warm and healthy and happy. It allows us to do the COVID work. It allows us to do the work we do with malaria, tuberculosis, HIV, Ebola, and other infectious diseases. We feel this bond is a great opportunity to partner with the city and strengthen our major, major public safety resource in San Antonio, which is Texas Biomed. This $11 million investment will better position Texas Biomed to respond with treatments and vaccines during the next infectious disease outbreak. I want to end, my time is coming to a close, I want to end with this quote from the Department of, Human, uh, of Homeland Security. Quote, the healthcare and public health sector protects all sectors of the economy from hazards such as terrorism, infectious disease outbreaks, and natural disasters. Because the vast majority of the sector's assets are privately owned and operated, collaboration between the public and private sectors is essential to increasing resilience of the, na of the nation's healthcare and public health critical infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you very much. As a little bit of housekeeping, just as a reminder, there are time limits. And so Kevin with the city here has a little device to help us move along with that. So be mindful of the time and just take a peek over here and you'll see how you're looking. All right. So next we're going to have a presentation from the Petco Love K9 Center Group. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Damian Cook. I'm the Director of Policy and Government Affairs for Canines for Warriors. Roughly 20 veterans die by suicide and over a thousand dogs die from euthanasia every day. Canines for Warriors is determined to change that and we, and we exist because of a fierce dedication to saving the lives of both veterans and dogs. We are the nation's largest veteran service organization focused on providing highly trained service dogs to veterans with suffering from post-traumatic stress, uh, traumatic brain injury, and military sexual trauma. <clears throat> Successfully guiding a veteran through the Canines for Warriors program and providing them with a service dog doesn't change just the warrior's life, it saves it. Our graduates of Canines for Warriors program are able to live a life that they previously did not think was possible. Many have significantly reduced their medications, gone back to school, 
reunited with their families, and found a renewed enjoyment in life. All of this is possible because of the powerful bond between a human and a human's best friend. The majority of our canines are rescued from shelters and surrendered or surrendered by their owners. And in saving these animals from abandonment or euthanasia, we give them purpose. Each pair who graduates from our program represents two lives saved, the service dog and the veteran. Okay. We'll skip that slide. Uh, tonight, our November class of is graduating, which marks our 700th warrior. But we must help more veterans. Our waiting list for service dogs stretches into 2025. We have a very simple strategy for serving more veterans. Go where the veterans are and be in the most military friendly city in the country. That's why we're invested here in San Antonio. Today, we have 41 Texas warrior graduates and we have 27 warrior graduate warriors on our waiting list. Through a partnership with the city of San Antonio, we've rescued over 100 dogs in San Antonio, invested $3.4 million, and added 25 Texas-based employees who work at our Texas headquarters located off State Highway 151. This facility was made possible through a lease from the city and is immediately adjacent to animal care services, which allows us to rescue dogs from them as soon as they're ready. To respond to the growing tide of veteran suicide, uh, which is over 500 Texas veterans time, people, and space. To prepare a service dog to be paired with a veteran takes six to eight months of training. To meet this demand, we're asking the city of San Antonio to include our request uh, for half of the funding needed to complete the master plan at our San Antonio campus. This investment will benefit the public by saving hundreds of stray dogs from euthanasia every year and using them as a direct response to the growing epidemic of veterans' mental health. We all know that this epidemic often leads as a contributing factor to the growing number of veterans who find themselves dealing with homelessness. We're proud of our, uh, we're proud of our home here in San Antonio. Our headquarters are located in Jacksonville, Florida. Being in military-friendly cities is something that we don't take for granted. We know the difference between military friendly and military tolerant. There is one. And so San Antonio has welcomed us. We appreciate that. And we would like to continue to grow that here in San Antonio to the benefit of, of all of San Antonio. Thank you. Thank you, Damien, on behalf of uh, the Canines for Warriors Petco Project. I'd like to also thank uh, Mr. Over, Dr. Overman and Mr. Majors from Texas Biomed. We're right on track. Next up is going to be, we're going to call out my, my co-chair partner in crime here. Dwayne's going to call out in order is signed up. Uh, those for public comment. I'd like to review again a couple more housekeeping rules for those of public comment. As, as Dwayne said, we're going to extend this period to 60 minutes. You will be called up in the order to speak as you signed in. Time will be allotted to individuals based on the number of speakers wishing to speak. If there is one individual, you will have two minutes. If there's a group of three or more, you will have a collective time of five minutes. We ask that everybody be professional, respectful, and courteous. As Dwayne mentioned, there's a timekeeper over here on the right which uh, signified by a, a green light, changes colors as you approach the, the, uh, uh, your expiring time. And for our colleagues around the table, if you can, jot down your ideas, thoughts, questions, or comments. And upon the conclusion of the public comments, again, we will allow the districts to take a few minutes to reconcile their ideas, thoughts, questions amongst each other. And then we will go around the table in various number of rounds, whatever it takes, whatever this group decides to ask the questions. And you can bring back up any agency to ask a question to and or of staff. 
Thank you. Just a few more housekeeping items. Um, the light will be green uh, at the beginning of your two minutes. With 30 seconds left, it will turn yellow. And then when time is up, it will turn red. Um, as the co-chairs read the names of speakers, um, we would ask that the, the person speaking be here at the podium, but the next person's name, which the, the, the co-chairs will call out two sets of names, be ready in the chairs right behind me. So you'll hear your name ahead of your, your actual speaking time. You'll be queued up right here. Uh, that's all, thank you. And if you have a mask, um, as you approach this podium, please feel free to remove your mask for clarity. And uh, as, as you um, share your, your passion or desires for the project you may wish to advocate for, and, and feel free to state your name and the district you reside in um, as you approach the, the podium. Dwayne, anything else? If not, you call the first ones up. All right, thank you very much, Chris. So the first set of names I'm gonna call, I'm gonna call three names. They're all representing District 10. And my apologies for if I incorrectly pronounce someone's name, charge it to my head, not my heart. So we have Vincent Ferris, Claudia Zapata Elliott, and Joel Haley from District 10. As you, as you come up, one more comment is, as you introduce yourself, the, your name, the district you reside in, the project you're advocating, advocating or speaking on behalf of, and if it is either on the recommended to be funded list and or it has not been recommended, that way our, our committee around us has an idea of where that project resides on the list of recommended versus non-recommended projects by staff. Please proceed. Thank Before you. you start, as as a reminder also, that we will just be hearing comments and presentations today. We will not be voting on any projects. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here this evening. My name is Vincent Ferris. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Meals on Wheels San Antonio. And yes, I am here to make a request of you. Uh, we are asking that you consider including support for a new headquarters and meal production facility for Meals on Wheels in the bond program. We're asking for a million dollars. I know you have many projects to consider, but I wanted to share a few details that I think will, uh, helps make our, our project a strong contender. We are leveraging other dollars from the community to make this project work. We've already raised nine and a half million dollars philanthropically from private foundations, corporations, and individuals. Additionally, we have secured $5.7 million in new market tax credits. We have just under $8.5 million to raise on this $23 million project. And we do have a $6 million commitment currently under consideration by another donor. We've already begun site development, launched construction. We're working with an all-star team here from San Antonio, that being Joris Project Control, Pape Dawson, LPA Design Studios. Annually, we deliver over 2 million meals to over 6,000 adults here in San Antonio and Bear County. The need obviously has been exasperated by the pandemic. Since March of 2020, we have been able to increase our services and intake over 2,500 new clients who desperately needed our services. We serve seniors all across our city and we bring impact to every single council district. We're profoundly grateful for the city's continued support of Meals on Wheels. In fact, this year we were awarded the City of San Antonio Senior Nutrition Program contract to provide delicious and nutritious meals to our community's 50 plus senior activity centers. This is an incredible opportunity as well as an awesome responsibility. And we consider ourselves blessed to be able to be recognized as a leader in senior nutrition for our city. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your considerations. And to each and every one of you serving on the committee tonight, thank you for the work you're doing in behalf of the city. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. My name is Claudia Zapata Elliott. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak to you today. Along with chef and entrepreneur chef uh, Johnny Hernandez, I'm honorary chair for the Meals on Wheels Capital Campaign Committee. And I really believe it's how we treat our most vulnerable citizens says the most about who we are as a community. Uh, back in 2013, I um, 
as a news resolution, I wanted to be, be volunteer more, do some hands-on volunteering as opposed to writing a check. So I became a Meals on Wheels volunteer, and every Wednesday for seven years, I delivered meals to some of our most vulnerable citizens. Um, the, op the, the experience completely changed my perspective and really created a passion in me about making sure that every senior has not only meal, I'm also a registered dietitian, and I believe while a meal feeds someone, it's a meal plus companionship that really nourishes someone. And these people, often the volunteers are the only person they see all day, the only person who asks how they're doing. It's an incredibly impactful experience to volunteer for Meals on Wheels, but we need your help. We need your help in closing and crossing the finish line with this campaign. So I ask you to please consider a $1 million ask. It's a small ask and it's, it's, the reward is profound. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Thank you, Ms. Zapata Elliott, for coming forward. Our next speaker will be Joel Haley. And our following Joel will be Melissa Arnell. Thank you. My name, <clears throat> excuse me, my name is Joel Haley. Uh, I'm a local attorney. I reside in District 10, and I'm the founder of the Haley Foundation which is a 501c3 that educates the public in animal welfare issues. Um, like many of you, I watched and heard the news of many animals that were injured during winter storm Uri uh, this February. In particular, I was disturbed by the report of 150 baboons at the Texas Biomed facility that had to have fingers, toes, and other portions of their bodies amputated. Um, in fact, over 15% of the baboons there had significant injuries. Um, and yet the Texas Biomed facility receives for 2020 total of revenue and donations of over $72 million. I feel that they do not prioritize their funding for acceptable animal welfare standards. <clears throat> and I don't believe that they should be receiving our San Antonio taxpayer dollars. Now, another problem I have is that the facility is not open to the public. In fact, in February, the media was not allowed to go and take photographs of the animals injured. Um, most importantly, um, I feel that the idea of primate research is being increasingly criticized in today's world and being replaced by other um, cruelty-free testing models. And I don't think that our city needs to be investing in something that's being outdated and replaced by more advanced scientific technology. And so I would respectfully ask that you vote against the funding proposal for Texas Biomedical Research Institute. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Haley. Ms. Arnell, followed by Stephen Heimer. My name is Melissa Arnell, and I'm representing the Greater Love Multi-Generational Center, which will be located in District 2. However, it will be an asset to the entire San Antonio community. Our project was part of the 2017 bond, with $2 million being approved for the construction of the center. Our original request in 2017 was for million dollars and we are thankful and grateful for the two million dollars that we received. Greater Love Ministries and for the Greater Love Multi-Generational Center raised one million dollars toward the project and we also offered our land for the project. We are here today to ask that you consider uh, funding one million dollars for the project so that we will have the full request that we requested back in 2017. This will fulfill the gap funding to bring the project to full funding, supporting the amount funded in 2017. COVID-19, the increase in construction costs and material costs has created a fund funding financial gap. The programs that will be offered by our project will be a, a highly rigorous pre-K programming, a senior center, which will serve the citizens of District 2, as well as citizens throughout the community of San Antonio. 
We will also offer after-school programming that will provide a safe environment for children in the community to extend their learning beyond the classroom. Programs and services will create jobs and serve as a community hub that engages youth, family, adults, and our senior citizens. It will address a menu of community needs, not only in District 2, but throughout the entire San Antonio community. So we humbly ask that you strongly consider our request of $1 million gap funding to bring the vision of the Greater Love Multi-Generational Center to full fruition. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harnell. Mr. Heimer, followed by Curtis Franz. Good evening. My name is Stephen Heimer. I'm the president of the San Antonio Professional Firefighters Association, Local 624. And I have a request, and there's a current project in the bond already. I represent my family of firefighters. I want to thank each one of y'all for coming out and the efforts to benefit the citizens of San Antonio. Right now, we only have one fire station to address in this bond, Firehouse 10. This station is sinking and was built in 1914. It was never designed to hold the weight of the apparatus that we currently use. It was designed for a horse and a wagon. Uh, we currently have stations that are in dire need and are at the end of their lifespan. At the current rate of one station per bond, it will take 270 years to address the needs of our firehouses. Um, SAFD firehouses, and you notice I say firehouses, that's because we live there a third or a half of our lives. Uh, we do it at 24 hours at a time. Um, these stations run 365 days a year, 24 hours, with no breaks on the facilities. We have more square footage of facilities than any other division of the San Antonio, yet only being allocated for less than 1% of this bond. Our firefighters, they take pride in the stations in the neighborhoods that they provide for. It's not about fancy or new, it's about basic needs. I met Councilwoman Castillo at Firehouse 33's. She saw how the station built in 1973 is come crumbling and deteriorating. How it was built with only one bathroom and we service men and women in this department. We have a woman's bathroom in the station which is a closet out in the bay that has no air conditioning and no heat in the winter. They currently have rat problems, mold, failing foundation, just as a start. In my firehouse, we have sewage that backs up on a consistent basis into the station because of the design of the building and the pipes that are in there. When we get back from a structure fire, we have carcinogens on our skin. We have to determine which one of us gets to clean off first because we can't use everything. Thank you very much. So we have next coming up, Ms. Gloria Hernandez, followed by Mariah Smith. Members Thank you. Go the, ahead, Curtis. Members of the committee, my name is Curtis Franz. I'm a lifelong resident of San Antonio. I reside in Council District 7, and I'm a retired San Antonio firefighter with 36 years service to this community. I'm asking consideration for reconstruction of two additional fire stations. One is fire station 21, the other one is fire station 33. 21 is at 5537 South Flores, 33 is at 2002 Southwest 36th Street. Fire stations are not a facility, but a home. We spend a third of our career lives living in our home. We conduct all the tasks that you would do at your home. Sleep, cook, landscape, water lawns, wax floors, empty trash, sweep, mop, and wash dishes. We are probably the only city work location where employees perform the tasks associated with home ownership as part of their job. Rebuilding of fire stations is a continuing process funded by bonds. Stations in existence prior to 1972 as a total of 32 stations. Eight have not been reconstructed, 14 have been reconstructed once, and 10 have been restruct restructured uh, twice. Justification for reconstruction of fire stations. The older stations have no room to expand and add resources or personnel to improve service in that area. 
maintenance costs increase as age increases. Adding improved safety features as exhaust control systems increases the electrical load and fire station 33 has an overloading electrical problem. Older stations are cramped with privacy and quality of life issues. How would you like to be sleeping in a dormitory with a snoring firefighter? Kitchen and eating areas are very cramped. Modern design provides individual rooms for each firefighter on duty and an open floor type, open type, open floor type plan for the kitchen, dining, and family room. There are no separate facilities for bathroom and a shower for our female firefighters. You females, would you like to be in the San Antonio Fire Department working in a station where there's no facilities for you, but you share them with the men? Same way sleeping in the dormitory. Uh, our female firefighters do do this. The structural conditions at 33s is foundation shiftings. Older stations do not have the air conditioning. I thank you for your time and ask for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Franz. Again, we have Gloria Hernandez and Mariah Smith up next. Good evening. My name is Gloria Hernandez and I'm the president of Las Palmas Neighborhood Association. And I'm speaking for, uh, in District 5, and I'm speaking for Las Palmas Branch Library and the West Side Strategic Area Development, which is uh, a recommendation by the district. When I first started the Las Palmas Neighborhood Association, I wanted to make a positive change in my neighborhood. I didn't know how, but I knew something would, would come up. So I got to meet a lot of new people, make a lot of friends, and we decided how we were gonna make our neighborhood better. So I met up with this committee. We had several meetings. And before I knew it, uh, we were working with the city working with city planners, working with city engineers, and I really uh, enjoyed that experience. So part of this project focuses on the area around Las Palmas Park, the YWCA, which is the Olga Madrid Center, and the Las Palmas Branch Library. The concepts and recommendations built upon a foundation of previous public input, investments, and coordination by the public library, Metro Health, Parks and Recreation, and the YWCA Olga Madrid Center. It established a coordinated approach among city departments and partner organizations and agencies for more coordinated community service provision and use of shared space and resources. This campus will be a destination, a destination in Las Palmas not just for the adjacent neighborhoods, but for all of the west side and the visitors from other areas of the city. A dynamic space with ongoing activities and programming that will reflect the history and culture of the area while also serving the important needs of the surrounding community, including health and welfare programs. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. Ms. Smith will follow, follow, followed by Ms. Bali. Good evening, bond committee members. My name is Mariah, I'm 19 years old, and I'm a citizen of San Antonio District 6. I'm also a longtime animal advocate and volunteer with Texas Animal Freedom Fighters, a locally based grassroots grassroots nonprofit organization. I'm here tonight to express my opposition to the proposed $11 million in funding for the private organization, Texas Biomedical Research Institute. Texas Biomed reported have, having nearly 2,800 primates in its research and testing laboratories in 2020. The facility already received substantial funding as one of seven national primate research centers in the United States, and I do not believe our local taxpayer dollars should be used to further subsidize the cruel and outdated practices that take place here. Texas Biomed has a history of serious animal welfare problems. The Humane Society of the United States documented animals living in overcrowded, barren, and unsanitary conditions 
mothers and young infants separated, resulting in enormous stress for the animals, and injured and sick animals who did not receive immediate or proper medical care. And in, and in, in 2012, the facility was fined $25,000 for violations of the Animal Welfare Act. It is also important to emphasize, alongside animal welfare concerns, that the substantial limitations of animal research are increasingly recognized, with multiple examples of the failure of using primates as models of human disease. Lastly, I just want to emphasize that primate, primate research is expensive and fraught with ethical concerns. San Antonio should be investing in 21st century science that will be more effective and of more benefit to humans while sparing animals from harmful experimentation. There are a lot of important community projects being considered that better reflect the values and ethics of this city. Including this item on the list threatens the success of those other projects. Mariah, we're reaching the, your five minutes. If you could go ahead and wrap up your comments, please. I respectfully request that you vote against the funding proposal for Texas Biomedical Research Institute. Thank you for your time. Sorry. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Pali, followed by a group presentation of Jesprit Carr and Joanne Harris. Good evening. My name is Christina Bailly, and I live in District 5 as well as work at District 5 as Executive Director of the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center. I'm here to appeal and advocate for bond support for the Guadalupe Theater. It is in dire need of renovations. And I was honestly very disappointed to not see it on the recommended list of projects uh, compiled by a staff of the city of San Antonio. Um, and that is because uh, the contracts department in the city sent for an assessment, an engineering assessment of the theater this summer. And they determined that out of 30 subsystems of the theater, um, scoring them from a one to a five, with a five being in excellent condition and one being failing, all 30 of the subsystem assessments of our theater landed in two poor or number one failing. Our theater is in dire need of renovation. They also assessed that the total cost for theater renovations will be $3 million. The Guadalupe Theater has been serving the community for 40 years, providing consistent programming with legacy programs such as the Tejano Conjunto Festival, now going on its 40th annual uh, festival. And lots of that happens in the theater. Our 43rd annual Cine Festival and uh, many other programs like holiday saxophones and lots of folkloric programs. In 2017, we received $450,000 to renovate the Progreso building where we opened up the only Latino bookstore in the entire region and in the entire state and only one of a handful in the country. The Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center brings people into San Antonio besides serving our own local community. So I really would like support in this bond package to renovate the Guadalupe Theater. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bali. We have coming up next, again, individuals that are speaking as a group, and that will be Ms. Jaspreet Karu and Ms. Joanne Harris followed by Ms. Maria Green. Thank you, good evening committee members. My name is Jaspreet Kaur. I'm the vice chair of the San Antonio Public Library Board and I'm a resident of District 8. I'm joined today by a fellow trustee, Joanne Harris, who resides in District 2. The, library, the San Antonio Public Library Board is a governing board that operates under the city of San Antonio city charter. And we have been deliberating on the needs of the city and the needs of the community that we serve for nearly 18 months now. I'll ask um, for each of you committee members and the co-chairs to reference a letter from our board that's being passed out now that highlights the details of five projects that we're asking for support for. Three of the library projects are currently on the staff recommendation for full funding. And we also ask that you consider adding two additional projects. The first three projects are the Central Library Renovation, which is a citywide project at $6 million. The Carver Branch Library Transformation and Expansion, which is in District 2 at $12.5 million. 
The Las Palmas Library renovation, which is in District 5, for $5.25 million. In addition, as I mentioned, we ask that you also consider funding two additional projects, one in District 5 for the Bazan Branch Library Transformation at $4.5 million. This branch has served, the, has served the local community for nearly 30 years and is in need of updates. And in District 4, we would like to extend service to the Port SA and the Lackland area with a $5 million funding project to provide much needed support to this Southside District 4 community. In order to provide additional information, I'd like to ask the committee to consider giving the San Antonio Public Library Board some time in an upcoming meeting so that we can formally present the projects that we are proposing here. In addition to serving on the board as a volunteer, I'm also a mother and the library has provided essential connection and grounding for my children in this period of extreme social isolation that we all experienced for the last 20 months. Our library system provides service and materials to patrons and we see in our key metrics such as visits and circulation ever growing numbers. But libraries also provide something more, something intangible. They enrich our city and they are one of the last places that are equitable, unifying and available to all. So I ask you to support your library and support the city of San Antonio. Thank you for your commitment to listening to the public and for donating your time for this important work. Okay, thank you very much, ladies. So the next person that will be speaking will be Miss Maria Green, followed by Mr. Billy Williams. Ms. Green, since you're speaking for an organization, you will be allowed five minutes. My name is Maria Green. I'm a resident of District 2. I yield my time to Ms. Monica Bright in regard to the Carver Branch Library. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Monica Bright. I was born, raised, and currently reside in District 2 on the city's historic east side. I am here to speak in support of Carver Branch Library. I am the secretary of the Friends of Carver Library, and I am here today to respectfully request your support in allocating funds from the proposed 2022 bond for a much needed and well-deserved renovation of Carver Library. The Friends of Carver Library is a member of the Friends of the San Antonio Public Library organization. Our role is to provide advo advocacy as well as financial and volunteer support to Carver Library. Our goal is to increase literacy throughout the surrounding community and our motto is a community that reads together, succeeds together. Carver Branch Library is one of the oldest library branches in San Antonio, excluding the Central Library. It was formerly the colored branch of the San Antonio Public Library system. It is commonly believed that Carver Library was built in 1972. However, Carver's history goes back much, much further in the 1930s, a group of soldiers stationed at Fort Sam and many of San Antonio's black community raised the funds to build the historic Carver Auditorium and Library. Carver Library actually started as a reading room inside of what is known today as the Carver Cultural Center. We would truly appreciate a return on this investment. Today, Carver Library hosts community programming and events such as voter registration drives, educational and career development, 
visits from Santa, the Freedom Black History Bus Tour, the annual San Antonio Pan-African Festival, the annual San Antonio African American Book Festival, the city's Kwanzaa celebration, as well as countless other educational, historical, and cultural events. Allocating the proposed bond funds will not only make the renovation and transformation of the historic Carver Library a reality, it will also reflect an equitable, equitable fiscal decision in what we would like to believe to be a post-racial San Antonio. This renovation and transformation project was planned at least a decade ago, but the plans have continuously delayed in lieu of renovating other branches that were built after Carver. We understand that the bond funds are limited and often spread out over our 30 different library branches, but we are currently struggling to continue certain programming and events due to the lack of space and outdated technology. The support of city council and our facilities committee would greatly improve the likelihood of approving these plans to renovate Carver Library, so we desperately request your support in making these plans a reality. If the bond funds are awarded to Carver, the Friends of Carver Library would also like to request that we be kept in the loop, as well as having a seat at the decision-making table. We would like to advocate for our community and keep them informed of the status of the project. So personally, I will tell you, I was born in 1977 and I grew up in Carver Library. That library means a lot to me and the community that it, that it serves. Our library believes in serving the whole community. I don't just mean everyone in the community, I mean the whole person. We have a children's library where we try to uh, educate the younger children in our community because we know children who read typically have higher grades and test scores, who then that makes them uh, better candidates for college, which gives them better careers, which basically uh, increases their quality of life. We have a teen center where we make sure that our teens in the community have a safe haven away from drugs, crime, and gangs. The best place for a teenager to be who may be considered at risk is within the walls of Carver Library. We offer career development. Ms. Bright, you yes, are sir. right at your five minutes. We'll give you a couple more seconds. I would just strongly, strongly ask that you support allocating these funds to Carver Library because we desperately need them to increase the size of our building so we can increase the services we provide to the community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Bright. Next we have coming up, Mr. Billy Williams. Good evening, committee. Uh, my name is Billy Williams. I'm a retired infantry officer and also a proud member of the Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Our Delta Rolanda chapter has been a member of District 2 since 1949. My most famous alumni of my fraternity is Martin Luther King. I come before you this evening to talk to you about the Alpha Education Foundation, which I'm the chief of staff of. Our vice chair is unable to attend, I just want to tell you a little bit about the Alpha Education Fund of San Antonio. It's a 501c3 nonprofit organization. It was established in 1985 and served as a charitable arm of the Delta Rolanda chapter. The mission of the AEF is to change the world, one youth at a time. We do this for our communities, work and socialize and in pursuit of additional educational advancement while being servant leaders. We engage and support minority and underserved communities to promote equality and community development. We encourage personal achievements and social consciousness through mentorship, health, wellness, higher educational and pursuits, and positive economics impact through physical responsibility and growth. What you have before you is a proposal that we are trying to build a community center on the east side. We're just in the initial stage of this process. 
It's a five phase process. We envision completing in five years. We're in the process of establishing an internal donor network with our fraternity brothers. We're establishing partnerships, looking at new tax credits, community block grants, and other things to bring this much needed facility to the east side. As you look at the presentation I have before you, it kind of describes the mission, describes our vision, and our intent for this facility. Mr. Williams, yes. you're at your five minutes. Okay. I mean, you're, you're two minutes okay. as well. We'll okay. give you a couple more seconds to wrap okay. it up. All right. Well, thank you very much. Again, look through it, and I look forward to any future questions that you may have. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Williams. Next, we have Ms. Isabel Castro, followed by Steve Verstis. Hi. Um, good evening. My name is Isabel Castro, and I'm a full-time artist and live in District 3. Tonight, I'm here to express concern over the proposed police substation in District 3 and advocate that it be removed from the bond at this time. I understand that there are residents in my district who feel that District 3 is not getting adequate service from SAPD, but how can a building that would be finished years from now help constituents who need better service right now? The public safety budget has been increased year after year, and yet residents in D3 still left out by SAPD. On November 4th, members of this committee asked for any and all available data that would statistically support the need for this substation. On the memo for this meeting, that information reference was referenced but not included. We must wait until after the public safety assessment is completed to determine the need for an additional substation. All relevant reports and surveys need to be added to the bond website as well. We must assess the way SAPD services District 3 so that the department can make necessary adjustments as soon as possible. $19 million is too high a price when we do not know the results of the assessment and the larger vision for the substation, substation is vague. I'm not talking about where it will be or how it will look, but how it serves the community other than being a locker room for patrol officers. Further, adding a substation will increase the annual SAPD budget, and the department has confirmed this in an email statement to Case at 12 published earlier in this process. The community has already expressed concern and skepticism that increasing the public safety funding every year is um, whether it's producing better outcomes. Building a new substation will guarantee that the city will have to spend more on policing once the new substation in D1 is completed and then increase it again if this one is passed. Again, I'm asking that the committee reconsider and remove this item from the bond and put that money towards the needs of the fire department and the libraries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Castro. Coming up is Mr. Vestas, followed by Lena Ekloff. Hi, my name is Steve Versteeg. I live in District 2. I'm primarily speaking on the ACS Veterinary Hospital, which is on the project list currently. Uh, first, I'd, I would like to say that um, non-city owned facility projects should be highly scrutinized. And in my opinion, they don't belong on the list. Uh, they have other sources of funding. And how do voters judge this great need um, that we have for all these projects? Uh, apparently with very little information. Um, these projects all got on the list with specific goals and estimates made, and all this needs to be documented in public, in my opinion. Uh, there's, a, there's a great need all over the city for improved animal care services. I have been bitten twice in the last two years when running and walking within a few blocks of my home. Uh, pet owners in this city need help. Seven out of 10 districts had over 1,000 strays impounded annually. This expanded facility will ensure improved capacity for spay and neuter. 
This will actually get them room for equipment like x-ray that they don't have now to accurately triage and disposition animals. This is not a Band-Aid. This is a long-term fix. Um, increased capacity of spay and neuter will reduce significantly the excess pet population year upon year. It will free up other facilities so that people like you can uh, get timely and low cost spay and neuters at other facilities. It will allow ACS to spay and neuter every animal impounded, which does not happen now. Um, so animal care services do not have other funding sources. The, the rescues in this city are overwhelmed and the city needs to step up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vestas. I'm going to conclude with Ms. Eckloff. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lena Eckloff. I am the campus director uh, for Canines for Warriors, Peco Love uh, Canine Center in District 6. I am a proud San Antonian of nearly 10 years, and as I'm sure you can tell by my accent, I was not born in Texas, but I promise I got here as fast as I could. So I want to highlight the, and share the work that my team and I do on a daily basis with San Antonio Rescue Dogs. We work with animal care services and additional San Antonio Rescue Partners to pull large breed dogs, which unfortunately are a group of dogs that are not very popular to be adopted. These large breed dogs that may otherwise be euthanized are given a second chance at life by being trained to become service dogs. These service dogs in turn are paired with veterans and save the lives of the veterans by giving them their dignity and their confidence back. The additional space we, we can get with our phase two expansion will let us help and save the lives of 100 veterans on a yearly basis. The additional space will also help us in partnering with animal care services and San Antonio Rescues, save the lives of 200 large breed dogs per year. Thank you so much for your time. That, include, that concludes our citizens to be heard, advocating for or against the various projects. At this time, we will, uh, we're not gonna take a adjourn or take a break, but Dwayne and I would like to give you um, and your colleagues from your district the opportunity to share ideas or thoughts amongst yourselves. We'll, we'll do this for a few minutes. Um, that way you can collect your questions together and ask them because we will go around by district asking for each district to raise whatever question about whichever project um, they may have uh, questions, comments uh, about. And again, this is for more of uh, seeking to understand, clarify, this is not the time to make motions or to attempt to maneuver dollars between projects or try to figure out how we prioritize. Right now we're in the fact finding mode. We wanna be able to deliberate and discuss um, before our next meeting. So anything else I left out? All right, so we'll just take a few minutes if you guys can um, get together as your district and we can, then we'll get started.
Okay. We hope that there was some good dialogue. Ask everyone to please. Take this time to remind everyone that the uh, facilities are located right here to my left. I want to say that's pointed toward the east. We failed to review this at the very beginning. If there is a uh, emergency where we need to depart the building, any door will exit and this door will take you out to the street behind me all the way back. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, before we call upon my council district going around, I'd like to ask uh, Razi, our director of public works, to come forward. There was a, a, a pitch to ask for um, funding the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Theater, which is an icon on the west side. And it, it turns out that that project may actually have some, some lifeblood in it that's going to be assisted by the city. So, Razi, if you could share that with us and tell us what's going on there. Yeah, this is a project we are proposing to be funded by TERS, Tax incre Increment Revitalization Zone, $3.5 million. Since the need was so much, in this bond, we were looking for other sources to make sure even our $1.2 billion goes farther than that. We were looking for some other alternative, and we thought this is the best way to fund this project. 3.5 million is coming from West Side Tours. That's a good news. But where does that stand? I think the question from Mr. Pena is: Has that been passed by the Tours board? We are going to take that one Tours Tours board. We had communication; is very positive, and we will take this one. Actually. When the board passed, we will take that one to council to accept the money and we start working on the project. Thank you, Rossi. Okay, so let's go around. Um, we've got just, just under 33 minutes and there's 10 districts. So we're gonna try to give three minutes per district. And I think we'll just go um, numerical order. If everybody's okay with that, we're gonna go, we'll go uh, clockwise. And so we'll start with district one. So I wasn't aware that there's going to be a format change and all three of us have different things that we'd like to talk about, one of which doesn't even pertain to D1. And, and that's okay. So you can, okay. each, it's, it's the, was meant to consolidate Understood. so that there's not repetitive questions for the district. So last meeting, I proposed a three minute time limit and that, uh, that cuts both ways to root down some notes for what I'm about to bring up. So uh, first, thanks for everyone that showed up today. I generally appreciate the public coming out and, and providing their voice to this process. And I also wanna thank city staff for responding to the um, list for all considered projects and just not the ones that made the recommendation. In our last meeting, Ms. Pena, a committee member from D5, brought up her concern over the uh, fire station 33 located 90 on 36th Street on the west side. She found me after the meeting and showed me some photos of this station and gave me some further inf information about its current issues. I'm a former firefighter paramedic, not inside the city of the San Antonio, and as such, I have a decent understanding of public safety facilities. You heard in here today about rats. They have mice in the ceiling. They have to keep their... Um, dishes and there's their utensils in separate containers because the rats and the mice constantly defecate and urinate on their eating utensils. They have foundation issues. The women firefighters are forced to share um, bathrooms with the men, same with the showers. It has some problems. When we talk about more of the problems, the sewage is backing up into their showers. They have leaks over the firefighters' beds. Uh, they have a generator that doesn't work. Their fire station's been struck because they have to pull out to uh, 36th Street to back it in because the station is too old to allow for drive-through uh, parking of the apparatus. So they were hit by a drunk driver and we're lucky we didn't have a line of duty death because of that. So I think San Antonio's bravest men, uh, bravest, and their district deserve better. The average age of the stations in D5 is 30 years old. No new stations in D5 have been built prior to 9-11. Station 33 is nearly 50 years old. That means Nixon was still in office. No substantial reinvestments have been made since its dedication, and as Eric mentioned in previous meetings, the city of San Antonio has years of deferred maintenance on its 1,100 public buildings. Eric and his team are trying to remedy that, but does this, test, does this pass the test when we look at an equity lens on the west side? Should the west side not deserve to have a public safety facility that they and their first responders can be proud of? 
how does Fire Station 33 receive a total score of 61, and of 20 possible points for public health and safety, it receives a score of five? How does a dilapid dilapidated fire station get a five while a theater gets a 10, a public canine facility gets an eight, and every library has at least a public health and safety score of 10? I ask that this committee that we are provided for a rationale for these, for these facilities and anything that has a non-zero score for the other category, because again, we're operating blind as to what other means and why they got points. But maybe there's a good explanation for this, and this is why I asked Rosie in the last meeting and why I'm seeking explication today. We asked for a grading rubric that would explicitly detail the criteria used to help us better understand how staff recommend these projects, and the absence of this information generates questions like this. So I may be a D1 appointee, but my council member has asked me not to look at these bond projects with a D1 lens, but rather what is best for the city. So in that spirit, I believe we have an opportunity within this committee to move Fire Station 33 into the recommended list, and that we, um, we, we do this in the betterment of our firefighters, our paramedics, and the west side. Because again, I don't think this passes an equity lens when we look at the historic disinvestment that we have on the west side of our city. Thank you very much. As a gentle reminder that we would show the same courtesy that we did with the citizens, please make sure you're peeking over here at the time or to ensure that you're finishing at appropriate time. Thank you. So each district is allotted three minutes. Um, I failed to make that perhaps clear. Each district will be allotted three minutes. So if you've got multiple questions, try to get your questions through. Um, otherwise, we're going to be here past 8 o'clock. I'm okay with that, but it's going to require a vote of all of us to be past 8 o'clock here. So um, we'll, we'll go ahead and move on. Uh, Jordan, do you have a question? I'm sorry, uh, Mar Mario. Thank you. If we run out of time, we're going to have to vote on additional rounds. So if you've got questions for the staff or of any of the... My question was for Rossi, we're still missing information that we requested on this. We're, we're operating blindly because no one on this table knows what resiliency means or how we define public health and safety or how we define equity, et cetera. So there is outstanding questions for city staff that can be answered in email or here. John, we can take note of that. He's asked for the grading rubric. Um, again, I know some information was provided. Obviously, it's not what uh, Mr. Jordan is looking for. Can we connect with him and, and make sure how we, how we sew that up? There's, I understand that all the projects were provided, the scoring Absolutely. system was provided, but there seems to be a disconnect. So perhaps if you guys could meet with Jordan off, offline or later so that we can get this provided and out to the committee. We'll make that happen. Thank you, sir. Mario? Thank you. Um, regarding the Texas Biomed Clinic, um, so humane methods aside for just a second, um, the score of local public health, I'm just wondering if they could just come up and ask and tell us or explain why they're, why this is scored high on local public health. It's my understanding that these are services. It seems to be a great economic development project, but as a local health provider, I, I just don't see the connection. That's one. And then two, for projects like Meals on Wheels that are not even on the considered list, that staff scored, are those, are we able to bring them up for consideration? I just would like to know how that would work. Texas Biomed, if we could get someone from staff to comment on, on that piece and then Meals on Wheels, yes, if you would like them to be added for additional um, discussion, Mario, we can bring them back at our next meeting to further present and or to an answer any questions that sure. this committee may have. Texas Biomed is here if you want to ask them a question. Right, directly. well, that's, that, I guess that question goes to, bio, to Texas Biomed. Yeah, come on up. Um, and then while you're up, we, we got comments about new technologies that would um, assist you in avoiding experimentation on animals. Can you comment on that as well? Sure, um, in terms of part of the local public health fabric. Texas Biomed is intimately involved in not only the basic research that goes on to deliver vaccines, but actually with local public health officials and local employers as a resource. You'll remember that there was a lot of confusion around CDC and some of the other governmental agencies and what folks were supposed to do. 
and we became a bellwether of, of advice for many major local employers that sought our help out because we were at the forefront of understanding COVID as something that was shutting down our economy and keeping our local folks out of jobs. So it was both a local and national public health addition, as well as keeping people safe and at work. Thank you, Dr. Mr. Pena, does that answer your question? Well, is that common practice or was that an emergency measure for COVID-19? Well, now it's become common practice because what most employers have figured out is that public health is now part of their obligation to their employees. They were never prepared. HEB was never prepared. Some of the large employers were never prepared to address public health issues with their employees. And now, almost overnight, they were. They didn't have a resource for that. And it happened to be that in San Antonio, Texas, one of the best resources to help these employers understand how to protect their employees and their families, get people back to work safely, was here at this Basic Science Research Center. And we continue to do that work. Okay. Thank you. So I, it would be good if you followed up with like, you know, your, your, your promise of service to certain agencies and to which agencies you're promising these or, or have coordinated efforts with in, in detail. I think I'd, I'd like to see that, Is that as a follow-up. Something we follow so are, there, are there contracts included? Like it, there's just not a whole lot of yeah, detail in, in your answer. Absolutely. We, we can respond in the response memo about the, sure. the public service and the public portion of this project. Lo local public service. Yep. Thank you. You didn't answer your question about what can they, can I not use primates? We would like to address the second question. answer your question. That's right. Lot, lot and the follow-up about, about technology and primate, and primate testing. I just want to make sure the chairs are good if we continue here. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I can I can yield if they can just quickly answer and then we can move on. And I, I think it's a re relevant conversation for one of two outside agencies. We'll carry on. Okay. Very good. I want to, want to thank those that have brought the, these comments, very, very good comments. Uh, it is not universally agreed that um, the use of animals in research is no longer needed, unfortunately. Um, the idea of organs on a chip as a form of research is, is, not, is not generally accepted as a means of comprehensive evaluation in the, in the pathology of infectious disease research. Uh, the the way that we and other national primate research centers under the National Institutes of Health operate is that we focus very much on minimizing the use of these animals as much as possible. The, the reality is a, a COVID vaccine that's saving millions of people around the world could not have been possible without these research animals. In fact, the, the animals are the, are the heroes. And, and at Texas Biomed, we have over 100 care staff of veterinarians and other animal care staff that take care of these animals. And in fact, the, the funding that we're seeking here, um, in addition to $20 million worth of investment that we're, we're starting construction on right now, this $11 million will go to actually further support and improve the, this environment for the animals. I'll, I'll, I'll move on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Majors. Um, so it, before we move on from District 1, uh, Mario, Meals on Wheels, is there, are, are you asking them to do additional presentation at our next public hearing? I, I think so. I just, again, I've... I'll learn to use it. I, I, I think so, because I think we need to know what the size of the project is and just more detail as if it was, you know, uh, any other project that's being considered so that we have the complete picture for consideration. Yeah. Okay, I think that that may be something we'll either get to later tonight unless somebody else asks a similar question as we go around the room. If not, we can bring them back at the next uh, Right, that was main test. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We'll move on to District 2. Can the biomedical people go back up there again? I think they should just stay for a while. <laughs> Sorry, so before we do that really quickly. I know it was said not to make motions right now, but I think this pertains to the meeting in general. Um, I move that any memos, documents, or any relevant uh, documents provided for upcoming meetings be provided to committee members at least 24 hours before we meet so that we have a chance to review that documentation and aren't forced to read it while presenters are presenting. Yes, as a reminder, they are online as well. We received this notification while we were sitting here at 5.30 an email with an update to the memo. And so I wanted to make sure that we, we don't have that happen next time. 
Yeah, I think it would be, John, do the best you can. And for all those agencies in the room, any documentation that you would like to share, I think that's a, a very valid um, request being brought forward uh, by Mohammed about get them to city staff and the sooner we get them into our hands, the more informed we can be. So thank you. All right, District 2, continue on with the questions. Go chair if I may, just oh. uh, uh, one clarification. Um, the memo that we provided to the uh, committee members today were questions that came after our last meeting. So we did our very best to try to get everything answered by today. So some of the questions just came in as of yesterday. So we're doing our very best to get the information to the committees as quickly as we can. So we'll commit to do that uh, with the understanding that we may not be able to get to all of your answers if, if you get them to us the day before. Right, I think Mohammed is asking for these handouts. The sooner we can get both for both. Yeah, I think both. he has oh, okay, for yeah. both. Yeah, yeah. Correct. thank you, Maria. Thank you for the clarification, okay. Maria. Sure. Appreciate that. All right, let's move forward with the questions. Yeah. So a few questions. Um, so, so you you made a motion. Yes. Okay, we so we have a motion and we need that motion. Second. Okay, so we have a motion and we have a second. Any additional discussions on that? Okay, so go ahead and repeat the question. Okay. The motion. Um, I move that any memos or documents that are relevant to upcoming meetings be provided to bond committee members at least 24 hours in advance of the following meeting to provide committee members adequate time to review. All right. Um, Co-chair, if I may, uh, as I stated earlier, for those uh, individuals that are coming to speak, uh, we don't have their materials ahead of time. They're coming here and providing that to the to the committee. So, um, and I'll defer to the city attorney's office, but I don't think we need a motion for us to provide information as quickly as we can, because we will do that. We are, our commitment is to do that as soon as we receive it. So, yeah, that's so would you like to withdraw the motion okay. or do you want to amend it to where appropriate or where they can? So I will, I will, I will with, withdraw it with the understanding that we all heard this here today and that we come in next meeting, please have as much as we can in hand prior to the day of the meeting. Yeah, okay, right. thank you very now, much. Now to the- Mr. Chair, but let me just ask this question to that. Does the public have the ability to send the document to the website so that we could at least go to the website? It'll have to be- ahead of time? It'll have to be funneled through the city um, in order to, so gotcha. they can disseminate that, that information to us and okay. upload it to the website. Okay. Okay, let's proceed on with the questions now from District Two or comments. To the topics at hand, right. Um, so I have a question that's for city staff mostly, but I wanna know what the funding mechanisms available to the city are right now outside of the bonds to cover fire station and fire home renovations are. Um, you know, to the point that was made earlier by a citizen, there's not a single report or proof that anybody could point to uh, that more funding towards police departments leads to decreasing crime. And I believe that it's been discussed that the exorbitant amount of money we spend on SAPD locally and public safety has not led to a decrease in crime. So maybe there's funding available within the general fund to support some of these fire stations outside of this bond dollars. So that's a question for city staff to maybe speak to. On the topic of Texas biomedical, um, you know, I appreciate the work. And I think we all appreciate the work on the COVID vaccine, uh, but that speaks to the national impact that they have and the national work that needs to be done for their, you know, to support them. So why are we footing the bill for their facilities when they're having a national impact? Have they looked towards the National Institute of Health for funding or the federal government at that? Um, and so with some of the questions asked earlier about the, you know, the fines and the issues with the, with the abuse of animals potentially, right? Um, how can we be sure that our tax dollars won't be put towards paying fines for mismanagement of the facility moving forward? I wanna make sure we have some answers to that um, to clarify what exactly happened and what was referred to by the previous citizen that spoke. Um, it was also mentioned earlier that a citizen was bitten twice uh, by neglected and stray dogs. You know, I've worked on at least six political campaigns myself and the main thing you do in a political campaign is you knock on doors. I've run teams of people knocking on doors and there's not been one campaign where somebody hasn't come back to me with a bite from a dog that's either neglected or stray. Um, people don't want to take the job because they're going to get chased by dogs and they know it. So 
I'm very thankful that the Animal Care Services Hospital is finally being prioritized, that we're finally kind of doing something to solve that issue for the city. Um, and it seems like a common request among members of this committee to be provided more information about these projects as a whole. Um, we know there's a plan available for the Animal Care Services Hospital. Um, we've seen it in other public meetings, um, but it hasn't been provided to us today. And I think it would be helpful if that plan was provided to us to review. Uh, we know that Shannon Sims, the ACS director, is here today. And I would move, well, not move, I'll choose my words carefully. I would request that we hear a presentation from him at the next public meeting uh, about the Animal Care Services Hospital, um, if that's at all possible. And that's the end of my questions. Coach, if I may, I, there's a question that I can address um, uh, right now, and that is about the funding for fire stations outside the bond program. So the city has several mechanisms to be able to fund our, the maintenance of our facilities or improvements to our facilities, our operating budget, which, which we do every year, and also our capital budget. So typically fire stations have been funded with a capital budget, which is certificates of, of obligation, and then the bond program as well. So as we continue to move forward, uh, we are working with the fire department to develop a five-year plan to be able to address some of those most critical facilities within the fire department. And that will be addressed as part of our annual budget process uh, for fiscal year 2023. Texas Biomedical has a response as well, Mohammed. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, speak to the local impact. So we've already talked about the local impact of public health and how a lot of the employers and public health uh, officials rely and work with us. The other thing to remember is that Texas Biomed over the next 10 years will double in size and the economic impact of this organization on the local community with all the relationships and partnerships we have with the university and other scientific organizations in town will be over three billion dollars a year in salaries, relationships, partnerships, and research that we are bringing into San Antonio. So this is not an organization that reaches only outside the city limits. Our footprint is pervasive and deep here in our community. I think just to add on to that a point, it's also important to note that prior to COVID slowing everything down, one of the, the greatest opportunities we had was to see the lines and lines of, of K through 12 school buses coming into to our facility. And we had the opportunity, particularly in underrepresented areas to for students, young students to be able to meet with scientists and, and see potential uh, career opportunities in front of them, life-saving career opportunities. With regard to the, the concerns that were raised about the, the animal issues, I believe that was in 2012, about a, about a decade ago. We'll, we'll have to pull that information out. We're happy to make that part of the record and pr can provide that. Um, in the past five years, we've invested a significant amount of money in the animal facilities. And in fact, um, we have received stellar remarks from the U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, that oversees all the primarily animal uh, research use in the United States. Also, we're regularly um, part of CDC, uh, CDC activities. And so really for the past five years, the, the efforts uh, of, of improvement have been made and are stellar results. Thank you. I'd like to thank Ms. Villa Gomez for coming up and addressing the fire station repairs and renovation I have a um, follow for Texas follow Biomed there. for attempting to address some of those questions. Texas Biomed, if you'd like to present any further documentation or brochures to help answer some of the other questions that may not have been fully touched on, please make sure you share them with city staff so that we can all receive it. And then Animal Care Hospital, I think that we'd like to hear from you at your next at our next public meeting. With that being said, we're already going to be at 740. We've got eight districts to go, so I'm going to move on to District 3. But he didn't answer the question. Yeah, District 2 didn't get their poll. But, but he, did, he didn't answer the question. I mean, why, why have them if they're not going to answer the question? So I want those guys to come back up there and answer the question. His question to you was, since you, you, you all do work with the U.S. Department of Health, you, you've worked with the U, National Institutes of Health, and because I ran one of the federal agencies for U.S. Department of Health, I do understand their their the the. The question to you was, the national you either to NIH or to the national at, at CDC 
do, or do you have grants and how you do, do you have funding for them? And if so, what is your, what's your, what's your funding schedule right now for them that would, that would ameliorate or uh, your request to us for city funding? I think it could be stated on the record and get a response, right? So that we yeah. can make sure. Ha that happy to <laughs> include it in the response memo. Does that, does that work? So we stay on track? Perfect. That's, that's fine. I just want you to answer the question. Yep. Yes, ma'am. That's totally fine. Just answer. That's absolutely. fine. If we you want to answer absolutely. the question. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I know it's district, and I truly appreciate everybody's, you know, input and questions, but in, in essence and respect to make sure district 10 gets some, some minutes left. <laughs> I will, I'll try. I'll just stick to my questions that me and my colleague here have come up with and make sure that I don't need a response at this point. It can come through staff and make sure that everybody gets the information. So, but for the record, wanted to state that as District 3 representatives here, we are in full support of the District 3 substation. Um, for a long time, we've been requesting it. I mean, the study's been there because it was never able to be funded. Um, finally got some funding to it. So we are in that motion and the community has shown support for that. So just for the record. Um, couple of questions for staff. According to the st uh, scoring matrix, staff sent out projects that were recommended and that were not recommended. There are about nine projects that have a higher score than about five projects or six projects that made the list. Can you tell me what was the recommending process like? Doesn't the score reflect all the criteria that staff took into consideration, such as citizens' input, cost of project, council direction, um, the year um, master planning, and all those kind of things? So that's one qu couple of questions on the scoring matrix and how the projects made it to the recommending and not. Um, another one, I am concerned about the city-owned facilities that did not make the list, the libraries, the fire stations, these other city-owned properties that we need to take care of that are 50, 60, 70 years old at times. While we're funding outside agencies, um, I have concerns in particular for the K9 for Warriors project. Um, I, needed, I wanted to ask also what's the market value of the land that they are currently residing on? What does the leasing agreement look like um, at this point? And then, um, so those that's a whole second question in reference to that. Three, um, Ms. Rodriguez here would also, which is a great point, does the fire department or does the public facilities have a master plan that could help us prioritize projects? You know, what fire station goes what? Is it funded by uh, CFOs? Is it funded by the bond project? So if we can get maybe an answer to that or how we plan to prioritize the future of our public safety facilities. Um, and then also going back into some of the Texas um, Research Center, um, I don't know if you are considering ARPA funds since you deal with so much with health and public health. A lot of those funds have not been claimed yet and a lot of them are going to public health facilities and programs. I would just urge you all to um, seek some of those dollars. Um, also, I saw a mention that Bear County is funding or helping, I guess, do a partnership with this. Where is that particular funding um, agreement at? Has Commissioner's Court approved that? Is that set in stone? So those are our questions for District 3. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, it's a, a little bit of a gentle reminder of a comment I made at the last meeting. I would encourage each of you to make sure that you're communicating your thoughts as well with your elected official from the individual council districts. I would suspect there may be a question or two that they may have already had some consideration on and as best as you can possibly be, I would encourage you to be you know, communicating with each of your city council representative. So thank you very much, District 3. We'll move on to District Number 4. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions that we came up with. Uh, we see that there are several fire stations that were um, considered on the consideration mm -hmm. list, and they're 21, 33, 53, 52. Is there a way to prioritize those in, you know, which are the ones in the most need so that if there turns out to be some funding available, we know which ones to plug it into or make a decision uh, as to which ones to plug it into if we want to go with, you know, another fire station? Um, that was my first question. And our second question is, has the Texas uh, Biomed um, ever requested partnership with the city before in the last past 80 years? And if 
no, why now? If there's a specific thing, um, are they are they lacking funding that they yeah, normally get from the federal government? Yeah, I'll ask him to come up and speak to that. Okay, thank you. If you want to carry on, I, I, I think question one we can answer at the, within the next, uh, I, I, I would assume question one about the fire station is going to require yeah. a little more research. Yes. Absolutely, we'll do, we we'll do it in the memo, that. but the, the direct question to Texas Biomed, I think we'll try and answer now. Okay. okay, great. I have one more um, that I also, um, that Sam has here. There are 15 recommended projects and 24 that were considered. So how do you want us to work these considered? Are, are these projects that are to be considered, that you considered, ones that can be plugged in if we are not recommending some of the other projects? So we were encouraged to have like a little tier for those that didn't get in, that mm -hmm. we had a list of ones that we felt like could be replaced <laughs> or be added to the list. So I'm sure staff is taking notes. The answer is yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Thank you. That's all we have. Yeah, thank thank you. you for the question. Um, since we were founded 80 years ago, Texas Biomed's work here in the city with the city um, has never sought any support, even though we're a not-for-profit from either the city or the county. But in the last five years, this organization has completely changed. And when COVID hit, it accelerated the opportunity for this to be a significant entity within San Antonio. That's why we're asking for your help. This is a moment in time when we can grab our place um, as it should be as an international destination right here in San Antonio, attracting top talent from around the world to come here to develop science and solutions for infectious disease, to have these people move into our community and to have all these research dollars and all of the secondary and third effects that they have to our community take root. And that's why we're asking the city to help us because our impact will be across the city. Thank you, great questions from District 4. Thank you for keeping it up. That, was, that, went, that went really well. District 5. Um, thank you for the comments that the public made and for the presentations that were made as well. Uh, we wanted to advocate for the libraries um, in District 5 and, and also thank uh, District 1 for advocating for fire station number 33. I did take the opportunity to go and tour that station and um, it's a need. It's a really big need. So, uh, and the other thing we also want to thank Guadalupe Theater will be getting the tours fund. Is that correct? It'll be getting uh, going through the tours. Tours. They're they're up for tours dollars. Okay. Yes. And what else? There, there is still a vote that needs to take place at the tours, but at this time, everything's looking positive. I think hopefully the community here can send that message forward. It, that could be a side message that this recommending body says, we didn't include, for instance, we didn't include the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Theater because we understand it would be funded through TERS, which, which we support. That could be a motion that may not have a dollar impact from it. An example is all I'm saying. Oh, okay. Okay, she'll continue. Um, I would... Um, I would recommend that the libraries, all of the ones that were in the list uh, that the young woman uh, listed for us today, the Central Library, Carver, Basan, Las Palmas, and the one at Port uh, S.A. Lackland be um, funded because libraries are our life source for our children and for all of our education. I firmly believe that Biomed is a wonderful organization, but that there is some ARPA money that they might, might access. Uh, so that they can continue the wonderful work that has been going on in this country to co protect all of us from um, uh, the, the contagious COVID-19. Uh, district, uh, the, dis the firefighter number 10, which is over by uh, some, uh, Little Flower, it's a, it's a, 
it's, it's a beautiful little place, but I cannot imagine how you could replace it uh, to, to become a building where it would really house uh, the firefighters that work out of there adequately. And so I'm wondering whether that's the best place to, for any fire de department, fire, any fire station to be there because it's too cramped. So it's just a question as to whether we should look at where these uh, fire place stations are located and whether that's the best place for them. I firmly believe they should be in better, uh, in, uh, better shape. Uh, they should be clean. They should have toilets for women and for men because more and more women should be getting into that uh, profession. And, and we should really look at uh, making sure that the fire department and the fire stations are in, are in uh, very good shape. And finally, um, I would like to say that uh, the substation, the, the police department substation, I read the comments uh, from your staff that said 250 uh, staff persons would be working out of that substation. I really would like a breakdown of where, how much money that's going to cost us in the city city budget because as we all know the city budget is very very high for the police department uh, and I'm assuming that it's going to increase even more when you have an additional substation and so I would like a breakdown on, on the expenses not only for the building but for the staffing of that building that would cause us to lose more money uh, in the city property and finally, uh, Mr. We're, Razzi's- We're at your three minutes as well. So can you wrap that up, please? Yes, one more, just one more item. Uh, that the art uh, budget is 1.5%. And I'm, I, I look through, I scan through this list and I don't see any art projects uh, being funded. And uh, there are some that are being considered. So I'd like, uh, I'd like to see where that, uh, that art project uh, might uh, fall. Uh, you know, in this in this proposal. Thank you. Ms. Flores, just very quickly to answer one of your questions about fire station number 10. Uh -huh. Our intent is to find a different location. Oh, are you? Yes. Because oh, okay. okay. to your point, it's too small yeah. to fit a new facility. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. We're in, the, in District 5? The, the new location, we have not identified a new location, but our goal will be to keep it with in proximity to where the, the current one is, to serve the same area. I'd also add that the, the, the bucket of money that's being assigned for the arts is coming from every single subcommittee, and the information is, is, uh, should be on the web portal, but perhaps that's something that we can recirculate again um, to the committee. John, let's go ahead and move to District 6. Good evening, Ramiro Gonzalez with District 6. Uh, one, uh, two questions, really. One, uh, for the for the canine facility, uh, if we can get a, a sense of whether or not for, for uh, San Antonio in particular, will there be a preference for San Antonio vets uh, to benefit from the, the trained, uh, trained dogs, trained service dogs? And then secondly, for staff, just of the projects that are, are, are proposed or being recommended, which other ones actually could be eligible for TERS dollars based on their location within one of the districts or proximity? Got it. Thank you, Ram. We'll, we'll work on that question in the response memo, but I'm going to let the K-9 gentleman speak. Thank you for the question. So <clears throat> we currently have five Bear County residents who are on our waiting list. And um, once the the service dogs are ready. Those Texans will be um, moved up first. So the Bear County residents will go first. And so is, is, will that be a practice going forward as a policy uh, for San Antonio veterans to get preference out of the San Antonio location? Yes. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so the, the San Antonio location is where San Antonio tech, San Antonio warriors will be served. Texas Warriors will be served here in Texas. Um, in, in terms of like priority, uh, that's all dependent on on the need of the of the Warriors. Since we're dealing with post traumatic stress, uh, we we revert to the needs of the Warriors in terms of identifying priority. I, I would just encourage to consider some way to prioritize if if San Antonio dollars are being spent on the facility if there can be priority or preference for our San Antonio veterans who are contributing to that. Certainly. Thank certainly. You. The step one is to reduce the waiting list from 2025 to, to bring that to a closer date. 
Thanks, Ramito. Um, for city staff, is that, John, is, does that make sense about any other projects that are available for TERS? We got it. Thank you. District 6, anything else? All right, thank you very much. Excellent. All right, next, District 7. So each of us have questions, so we're going to try and break this up one minute each. Uh, I uh, My name's Carrie Neff, and um, I, reading through all of this, see uh, the term resiliency uh, used, and I think maybe misused. Um, resiliency is a city or a structure that withstands the impact of adverse events, and I feel like... Um, in reading through this, uh, some of these things are more recovery uh, efforts, and in particular, back to Texas Biomed, talking about burst pipes and the structure and systems in place. And um, we do have, um, I think, potential for outside funding for that with the Property Assessed Clean Energy Funding. Um, have they been considered for this type of funding, or have they looked into that type of funding? Um, and I'd also like to comment that they, Texas Biomed just received $37 million in June from the National Institute for Health. I got that straight off of their website. So um, how are we contributing to those uh, dollars and they don't, or the, the plan? Um, and is that plan a resiliency plan or are we just fixing their burst pipe for them? Um, I don't need an answer. Um, and I feel like the same, I, I, I believe that our police and our fire station should be in a resiliency project so that the infrastructure of all of our stations, substations, all of our first responders don't have to live in horrible conditions, working conditions. And I think that this year, um, in February, if there is absolutely no doubt that they are very important and vital to our uh, city and they deserve uh, funding for resiliency and not just recovery with the generators. So I'm gonna pass to Melanie. So Melanie Coffin, um, and I just had a question for the multi, uh, Greater Love Multi-Generational Center. They presented um, today, they're not on the list, but they also presented to Parks and Rec on Tuesday. Are they asking for two separate amounts or are they just hedging the bets? Yeah, it, at the risk of speaking for them, I believe they're asking for one set of funding, but they went to two places. Okay. One million dollars period, but they went to two committees. So if one committee recommends them, I mean, it probably won't, right? Correct, but... we'll make sure that there is um, communication between okay. you. Um, okay. yep. Just, um, and then of, for the canine warriors, um, you gave the, the statistics on the actual warriors receiving the dogs, but we know that you're using um, San Antonio dogs to train and have a partnership. Um, will you only be using San Antonio dogs or will you be bringing dogs in from across the nation? And, and will our dogs be given priority? Um, because I assume it's life-saving for them as well. It is. So, no dog, first of all, no dogs ever go back to animal care services. We always find them a forever home if they aren't paired with a, with a warrior because they don't meet the, cri the high criteria to become a service dog. And yes, we do prioritize animal care services dogs. They're literally right next door to us. So, it, it is advantageous to us to be pulling from there first and foremost. The only time that we would bring dogs from somewhere else is because we have warriors waiting. If we have warriors waiting, then yes, we may. But that is, that's not our intention. Our intention is to, to find the dogs that we need from ACS and bring them over to our facility, train them up, and pair them with their warrior. Thank you very much. That's your time for District 7. We have one quick question. Well, that's, you, that's, you, you could submit them, to, submit them to us written if you like, or you could go ahead. No, I, I just wanted a little follow-up on that, uh, on Canine for Warriors. Uh, will, will our, our dollars, uh, they're going to be used, will that m most of the money stay here in San Antonio, or are they going to be delivered nationwide? The the dogs? The the funding. The funding. No, the funding will stay here. The funding It'll stay will in San Antonio. To, yeah. The, okay. The, dog, the dogs, we will, will go to Texas Warriors. 
Okay. That was just a quick question. And just one more quick thing. I'm, I'm also a 36 year, uh, retired firefighter and, you know, I appreciate, I, I want staff to take heed all the, all the fire station, uh, talk that's going on tonight with my brother, Jordan, some of my brother firefighters spoke earlier, Rasul, Jennifer, uh, Rita, uh, I just can't wait for that five-year plan and, and just to see what, uh, we're going to do about that. Uh, thank you. Long, long overdue for sure. Yes. District 8. Yes, uh, I'd like to start by thanking the city staff for <clears throat> all the answers they gave uh, us uh, earlier with all the resiliency projects and the generators and the facility status. I think that was a lot of detail. I think it'll help us understand and support those efforts uh, as we're asked with other citizens. We also had a question about the biomedical, Texas Biomed, and maybe it's already been asked, but just to clarify, we were just interested in what the funding looks like for that organization on an ongoing basis. Maybe it's on the website, we haven't looked, but in terms of you know how big an impact what we're being asked to do would do, um, just a little bit more detail on that. Uh, the right, the, uh, including the total federal funding that's, that's and, and again, this can be a question that you can provide later. We didn't necessarily need it tonight. Um, one, one other thing then, uh, another item on uh, on the library projects. We uh, we got a fairly detailed list of, uh, of projects that were proposed. See, some of them are being recommended and, and some are still on the wish list, which um, I think we've got a lot of information here. Did have one question on the Las Palmas. Um, it was a little confusing. Um, the, the ask was 5.2. Uh, it looks like, um, only part of that is the library. And uh, uh, I guess what I'm interested in is what is the plan for the rest of it? Uh, I believe it's the, uh, someone spoke to this. I'm sure there is a plan. I just don't, I don't think we've seen it. So could that be made available? Absolutely. What, what the, the total scope of that project? Uh, Absolutely. And, and, and we appreciate that district aid. You've asked some questions that can be answered uh, right. after the fact. We right. are obviously past eight o'clock. Uh, Dwayne and I have talked about it and as, as chairs, we're going to extend this meeting and wrap up District 9 and District 10. And then we will take a motion if the group would like to continue the meeting and dialogue and discussion or we can adjourn. But at this time, we're making the decision as the chairs of this committee to continue on and allowing District 9 and 10 to wrap up their questions. Is District 8, are we good? I don't want to cut you off. Fantastic. Yeah, District 9. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lisa Taylor with District 9. A couple of questions are for the city. What does the city charter say in regards to the bond funding non-city owned projects? That's my first question. And then the second is, could we get a list of facilities that were funded in the 2017 bond that have not been started, if there are any? And then the others regard um, some other projects. Um, I would like to get more information and correct me if I haven't received um, more than a general district uh, description of the Ella Austin Community Center. We didn't have anyone uh, discuss that today. And then the other is um, the uh, Carver Branch Library, Las Palmas and Central. Um, I know that the speaker mentioned that she, uh, that there are metrics as far as usage um, and I was wondering if we could get those. And I asked that because when I looked at the list of projects and the scores, there were so many requests all over the city for either new branches or expansions on branches. And I think that um, I didn't know if there was any room at some point to review and think, you know, maybe we can work a couple of those in if they're one or two million type dollar projects. So again, metrics on libraries that are on here. Um, what does the city charter say about non-city owned facilities? And can we get a list of 2017 funded projects that haven't been started? And can we get uh, some more information on Ella Austin? Thank, Thank you. you. So we'll, we'll allow for the city to send those questions, the response to those questions to the group 
and we will also request to have someone from Ella Austin present at the next meeting. Thank you. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump back to Muhammad here. 24 hours before we meet, as soon as you can get this together, <laughs> please get it to us. And it doesn't need to be, we're gonna wait until the 11th hour to put it all on there. Even if you get it piecemeal, upload it piecemeal. I think anything and everything, whenever we can get it, as soon as we can get it, it's gonna be great and appreciated. All right. Thank you, District 9. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll try to be quick. Can we get a dollar amount for the two additional proposed library projects? Can you confirm the location of the proposed Meals on Wheels project? And how much has the Biomed Institute already raised for their capital plan? All right, so let's deal with the last one first since they're still here and have them come up and respond to that. And then the question with respect to the dollar amounts, if we can get city staff to send that out accordingly. We'll include those amounts in the follow-up memo. Thank you. I, I, yeah, I think all three of them could be answered. Okay, that's fine too. So, we'll, we'll answer okay. all, all three of the memo. Okay. Perfect. All right, perfect. Okay, so we're at 806. And uh, a lot of great questions. It is up to us how we can choose to proceed. My, my five-year-old should hopefully be getting ready for bed. He may not. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we extend the meeting till 9 p.m. I have a second. motion to extend the meeting to 9 p.m. Does anyone want a second? I'd like to remind that we have two meetings after this, and then we are supposed to push this towards council for their rec for their final vote. So we, we just don't have a lot of time, and I would be willing to guess that there's still plenty of questions from committee members. That's fine. You Mr. Mr. Guy, would you accept a friendly amendment to extend the meeting to maybe uh, 8:20? I accept that. I will motion to amend the amend, or excuse me, I, I would like to amend the motion and that we extend the meeting to 8:20. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. The motion passes of seventeen to thirty. You and I not voting. Big guy. <laughs> Can I make Move. a quick sec uh, motion here to not start with District 1 always in order? <laughs> I think you We're can, not even going to go to that. Uh, yeah. We're not even going to go to that I, motion. I second that so motion. we have a motion in a second, and it is approved to continue this meeting for 12 more minutes to 820. I don't, we're going to start back at 10. There you go. And 30 seconds, if you, 30 seconds to a minute, do you have any other questions you'd like to raise? Per our discretion, we'll we'll deal with that. Not starting with District One. We got that. <laughs> District Ten. Anything else? Uh, no, we followed directions and compiled a group list and kept it concise. <laughs> I rescind my motion. District Nine. Any further questions you'd like to throw up? Thank you, District Eight. Uh, We'll start with uh, thanking the K-9 Warriors uh, for their presentation. Let us understand the, the impact. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we also had a question about, oh, back to the uh, to the firehouse, all, all of the um, resiliency. Uh, I, I guess the question we have is as far as on, on the maintenance, it, it just seems like there's a lot of overdue maintenance. And what is, is there a plan or a master plan for the fire stations that hasn't been implemented or is there some process that's underway now or, or what does the future look like other than just replacing them, which I'm not saying we don't want to replace them, but it just seems like maybe they're, they're not being kept up also. So what is that plan? Sure, so we can provide uh, to the committee our deferred maintenance plan that we implement with the budget every year is about $5 million. And that takes care of uh, facilities like the libraries and fire stations. And that addresses issues like HVAC replacements or fixing floors, parking lots, uh, bathrooms, those types of things. 
uh, replacements are done with the capital budget, either the bond program or certificates of obligation. Uh, we are working on developing a five-year plan to address those uh, needs of our fire stations. Uh, uh, Deputy Chief Monastir is, is here and he's in charge of our facility, so we'll be working with him to develop that plan uh, and to be able to implement it as part of the annual uh, budget process. We don't have, to my knowledge, a strategic or a master plan on facilities, right, Chris? I think the answer is no. Um, so is that that we haven't done uh, or um, followed up that master plan, but it's something that we can report back on the condition of our facilities. I don't want to give the impression to the committee that all of the 53 fire stations are in the same condition as fire station 33 or fire station 10. I was going to save this to the very end, but uh, Ms. Villagomez, Almost every district has brought up our first responders and particularly to the fire stations, the firehouses, where it said they're more, almost a, a third to almost half of their adult working life is spent at the, at the station. And I think that as all of us here needing to be advocates of the bond program that we are trying to pass and support as a collective group, we want to go to our community. We want to go to the constituents and tell them that we are investing money and not just through the bond, but the city and improving all infrastructure. So yeah, that could be a very high level broken down, but we don't want to leave here worried about fire, firemen sleeping cot to cot or a firewoman who wants to get into the academy and can't be assigned a station because of some type of, of whatever set up or not having the right facility. So I think that big holistic approach to let us leave here in comfort knowing that the city is using bond dollars, maintenance deferred, and or general budget dollars to improve upon our public safety and first responders. Thank you, District 8, District 7. Melanie Coffin, I will be submitting by email a request for more information on the Magic Theater projects, but I'll do it through email. Thank you. Um, I, I think to your point, this is about recovery of, of things um, and not to be pedantic here, but I would like to second his request to um, see what kind of master plan they have um, as far as resiliency, like true resiliency um, in, in these stations, in these projects. And I would like to know if they have been um, have they considered benchmarking initiatives um, in these projects to um, for the infrastructure? And if they don't know what that is, I know of at least five district council people that know what benchmarking is. So, um, so I guess um, my question is, as far as the police and the fire have, or any of these facilities, have they been informed or looked into the benchmarking program? I think this is a good opportunity, and I know that we're going to extend it a minute or two just because of me belaboring the issue, but I, this is a great example of the, a, a motion at our fourth meeting that can be made to city council and our elective officials that, that Dwayne keeps reminding us to go and talk and advocate towards, is that this community, this, this committee has heard and is concerned about the, our, those facilities, and we encourage city council to invest money in a comprehensive plan that supports the department's long-term goals and we're not waiting 270 years to update it. I think that's a great example of a non-dollar value related to the bond package, but thank you, District 7, District 6. Go ahead, go oh, ahead, Madam. Good chair, may I may? I, mm -hmm. I do wanna make something clear, the reference to not being able to replace every single facility in 270 years. Um, I don't know where that is coming from. Um, we are currently doing a facility assessments of our, all of our police uh, stations that will be completed end of this ca um, calendar year. So we'll be presenting that to our public safety committee with the results of uh, all of our police uh, facilities. For the fire department, we haven't done a complete assessment. However, we are an accredited um, uh, department, so that means that we were uh, have to meet national requirements on our facilities and the equipment, and we'll be happy to present that information and provide that information to the committee. Thank you. Yes, go ahead, Pa. 
Hi, I had um, a question Six. about the $3.7 million to um, rehabilitate and resilient do some facility upgrades with the East Side Clinic, the Northeast Clinic, and the Buena Vista Clinic. I got a little confused because on your PowerPoint, it was under non-city owned. So can you describe to me what parts of those clinics are city owned? Do we have some leases where landlords are not um, doing upgrades that are needed? Can, can you just tease that out a bit for me? That might be a city staff thing. Thank you. That's some good general information for us all to have. Thank you. All right, five. Yes, I wanted to ask a question uh, regarding the San Antonio Police Department impound lot relocation. If there's any more information, can we get any information on that? And also I wanted to ask um, Biomet, um, a young lady came up here and said that there was a lawsuit for $25,000. I'd just like to know what that's all about. Can someone um, answer that, answer this question? John, you, you want to comment? I, no, I just, do you want us to respond in the memo or do you want to stop what you're doing? And oh. I'd say respond in the memo. Okay, is that okay? Can I just ask one question? Are, is all this money being distributed equitably? Everybody talks about looking through the, you know, the, the, the looking at equity in this, in this uh, city. And I'm wondering if we can look at it in that way also. Sure. I know that they came up in our last meeting and we did discuss that, but if city staff can send that out, I had suggested that we maybe even just break it down by each of the city council districts so that we could see. Thank you. Yeah. That's start, I All think. Right. All right. Thank you. Dis district four. Anything? No. Nope. All right. District three. Three's good. District two. I'll let, I'll let you go first. Okay. I just, uh, Ms. Martinez, you said uh, something that I think is absolutely, would be a great contribution of this committee. N not only do are we looking at fire and police buildings, we're looking at libraries and yes. community centers. We really do need a master plan for maintenance. Uh, working at Ella Austin Community Center, it's a hundred year old building. And what the fire department talked about are the very same things that we have to deal with. And we're dealing with early Head Start centers, seniors. So we've got to be able to support the city um, because I don't, it's not the staff. They can only do what they can do if they, if they don't have the resources. But I do think that we, this is what bonds are for, is that we really encourage the city and we consider really best and highest use of some of these bond projects to come up with a master plan that is fully staffed because what happens is we allocate these monies and it takes two to three years to actually get these projects done, which is ridiculous. This doesn't happen in other major, major cities. We need to move that forward, add, add capacity to our, to our city staff to get these projects done. With, with, we've got plenty of contractors who need the work. But, I, but you said a, a mouthful when you talked about a coordinated plan for municipal facilities, not just police and fire, but for all of the city-owned facilities. Absolutely needed. Well said. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify my question from earlier to make sure we get the information back that we requested. And so um, I just want to make sure that we explore from city staffing information back about the likelihood that money from the current public safety budget from the general fund or capital funds, whatever else, can be allocated towards um, the fire stations or upkeep of these facilities. Um, I know you're doing great work, Maria, currently with the police contract negotiations. I appreciate what you're doing there. And I wanna make sure this question comes up now while that negotiation is still happening, because that might be a factor in being able to make this happen. Sure. Um, you know, I think that's a different conversation to have. We're discussing bomb projects in, in this meeting. You're talking about our operating budget in the general fund. Um, that budget is balanced and is completed. Um, I think that's a, a separate conversation than what we're having today. 
and that would happen as part of our operating budget process and we go through that process beginning in March, April timeframe uh, to make changes to the operating budget. Now those operating dollars, um, we reserve those for the day-to-day -day operations of the city. The opportunity that we have with the bond program is to address those long-term capital construction projects that we wouldn't do out of our general fund or wouldn't typically do out of the general fund. No, I understand that. I just think that if we're voting on and trying to determine what projects this bond dollars go towards, if we know there's other funding mechanisms available from the city to cover some of these things, we can decide to move them off this list and place it on the other list for the city. Sure. At, at this point, the, the funding mechanisms that, that I mentioned, it'll be our certificates of obligation that we go through an annual process to be able to allocate those dollars. We do a, um, a six-year capital budget, and we have set aside dollars to be able to do the projects that we currently have. As we do our, our operating budget and if our property tax values grow more than what we had anticipated and we have additional capacity, that's how we can do additional projects. So I, I don't have a funding source today to be able to tell the committee there's another uh, funding source for sure that we can move some of these projects out of the bond program into another operating um, funds of the city. The, the other funding that we're considering is the ARPA funds, and we're going through the community process right now to get priorities. And what we've heard as far as, uh, as infrastructure projects have been drainage, uh, parks, and streets. So that is the other funding source. And again, it's going through that, that process to get input from the community. Public safety facilities have not come up as part of that process with ARPA. Um, but um, again, that's, that's the, the other funding source that is available to the community um, to give us priorities for. Thank you, thank you very much. I, I think we saw an example of that today with the Waterloo, the, the TERS dollars that are coming up. So I think city's keeping an eye on those things. Thank you very much. Uh, District one. So it's for staff. What's, what's the cost of inaction with these fire stations? Um, to Ms. Davis's point here, she said that most of these bond projects take a few years before they get off the ground. When was the last time we had a fire station built outside of the bond? Because if my memory serves me correctly, and it often fails me, um, that the last time we had a new fire station built was 2014. So I'm sitting here asking myself and the rest of the committee, what happens if we do not act through this bond and push this up as a recommendation? We'll get that information. I don't remember off the top of my head. Uh, we've done uh, fire stations 52 and 53 as far of uh, the as part of the annexation program, and then actual replacements. We've done those as well. But we'll get you a list because I don't remember the exact dates when those um, came online. Okay, and if I recall correctly, 52s and 53s is a portable building. It's a temporary building. Those are what we call temporary fire stations. Yes. And the life of a temporary fire station should be what, five years? That's the city's plan? I don't know. That's a question for Rasi. Five to 10 years, Rasi? Five to 10 years. So those are already getting close to the 10 year mark. So this is my point. If we don't act now, what does it look like? So if we can just get some sort of general idea of what our cost of inaction is, I'd be much appreciated. Thank you. Fantastic. We are at 823. Okay. Before we take any other motions, um, just like to thank all the public that came out to share their ideas, thoughts, and, and uh, criticisms of the various projects that are out there. We'd like to thank the outside agencies that came forward, and most importantly, uh, thank the city staff for all of their energy and effort that they've put in to attempt to answer our questions to the best of their ability. And then, of course, all of you around this table, that's what it takes. It takes a village to raise a family, and that's what we're doing tonight. I love the way Dwayne says it. It's a lot of money, and the need far surpasses what that money can support. It's going to take a lot more dialogue, asking the right questions. And I'd like to remind the committee, Saturday, December 4th, we're doing a road show. If you would like to see anything in particular, please email Dwayne, myself, and John. If we get unindated with we want to go all around the city and look at every project out there, we're going to have to prioritize and strategize our little travel plan of how we're going to get this accomplished. So please email Dwayne and myself and John so we can get that worked out. And that's on Saturday, December 4th. Our next meeting is going to be on Thursday, December 9th. Another public, public comment hearing where we've heard a couple of um, 
projects have been invited to come and speak to us. And then we're going to take, really do the deliberating discussion and, and, and the sausage making process. And that's going to be on December 16th. Dwayne, right before we adjourn, uh, do we, any other comments for you? No, I, I, I ditto uh, comments made earlier about the staff and their efforts at you to be commended because you got a heavy lift. So we appreciate that. Appreciate each of the committee members. Uh, again, I will encourage you to reach out and have a conversation with your uh, council appointee, you know, the person who uh, city council person who appointed you to the committee. Um, that, that that communication can really go a long way. But thank you again for everything tonight. Seven days that we are all turkeys. Mr. Chair. Enjoy your families. Enjoy yourselves. I, I had one. I'm sorry. I had one motion. This is for both of you all as chairs. Um, and this we can call this the master facility um, Martinez Robinson plan. But I would ask that you all find out or have the city provide to you. What is our facility plan? And most importantly, not only what is our facility build out plan, but what is our facility maintenance plan? Because this to me is very clear that we have an ongoing maintenance issue of our facilities. John, that's come up more than all. once. Gobble, gobble. God bless you. Be safe going home. Have a great Thanksgiving with your families. God bless and good night. Oh.